So we have several ways to look at and classify matter. Uh, the first way that we can do it is simply to classify by state, and that's just to call something a solid, a liquid, or a gas. So we can basically uh, classify all matter by the types of stuff that is in it. Um, we can classify air as a gas, or we can classify tap water as a liquid, we can classify the wood dais that I'm lecturing at as a solid. A more useful way of classifying matter is to classify it by composition. And that just means that um, we would be talking about pure substances, one type of chemical only, so things like N2 or O2 or H2O, so a glass of plain old water or a tank of plain old nitrogen or a tank of plain old oxygen. On the other hand, there are mixtures. That's two plus chemicals. Tap water, which we'll talk about in another couple of chapters, is a mixture that contains two plus chemicals. Air is definitely a mixture. And this is the way that we'd really prefer to talk about them. And so we'll be focusing on this classify by composition uh, portion of mixtures this time around. So the first thing we'll talk about is describing pure substances. And pure substances are what we call elements. They cannot be broken down any further using any chemical means. I can't take any sort of chemical reaction. I can't take any sort of uh, means to break apart N2 once I've got it, or O2 once I've got it, or argon. I've got to pick up some really, really big guns that uh, are not very much possible. There are 118 known elements as of April the 10th and April of 2010, and still as of today. Most of them have names. Uh, they've just most recently named uh, 113 and 111. You can describe uh, elements using chemical symbols, and all those are one or two letter abbreviations. So gold down here gets the chemical symbol AU. Notice that gold and AU don't correspond, right? This comes from the Latin name for gold, aurum, and so they call it AU. Mercury is another one of those. Mercury is HG. And that stands for hydra argium, which just means liquid silver. And so you can kind of get the idea, right? If you've ever seen mercury, especially in this picture down here, it looks like liquid silver. Lastly, uh, helium is another example of a chemical symbol. It gets the chemical symbol HE. HE comes from helios, it's the word for the sun, and that's because that's how uh, helium was originally discovered, was looking at the uh, emissions from the sun and noticing that there was a new set of uh, lines that didn't belong to any known element, and they said, named it helium from that point. It turns out that elements are well organized into groups with similar properties, and that's going to make all the difference going forward for us. So we know that uh, pure substances can't be broken down by any further chemical means, and so uh, we think of them as the building blocks of uh, life, and basically the building blocks of the elements themselves are what are known as atoms. Atoms actually aren't a new idea. This comes from a Greek word, and it was atomos. Oh, goodness, there goes my mouse there. And all that Greek word means is indivisible. It was a philosophical concept. Phil uh, philosophers like Leucippus and Democritus here in uh, the 5th century BC needed that concept of indivisibility, something that was this elemental part of life on Earth in order to make their uh, philosophies work. And it laid, um, laid pretty quiet for a while until a guy named John Dalton in the 18th century formalized an atomic theory. He brought the word back in 1808 and he brought the idea back. And what he proposed was that, again, an atom is the smallest unit of an element that's a stable, independent entity. I can't break down an atom any more than what it already is without making something unstable and dependent and it has to um, it, it exists in a very different way. So if we break down an atom, there are several parts to it that we're interested in. The first part are the protons, and those are the positively charged things, so you'll see them as P or sometimes P+. Plus. Um, what protons do is they help us identify an element. So carbon, for example, has six protons. On the other hand, hydrogen has one proton. And the number of protons tells you exactly what element it is. It can't have six protons and be anything but carbon. It can't have two protons and be hydrogen. Protons are found in the nucleus of the atom, and that's this middle region here. I'm representing them by these nice big blue balls. 
The other thing that we find in the nucleus of an atom are neutrons. And, um, your book will talk about these in chapter 2, uh, so you'll be seeing them very shortly. But neutrons have absolutely no charge. Protons are positively charged, so they're pluses. Neutrons have no charge. They help determine an atom's mass, because even though neutrons have no charge, they're pretty heavy. They're just about as heavy as a proton, and so um, I can count them pretty much equally. Neutrons can vary among elements, and so I can have an atom be carbon but have seven neutrons, or still be carbon and have six neutrons. Those are both possible, and that's what we call isotopes. Again, neutrons are found in the nucleus, so the nucleus is positively charged. It has only plus charges. The last part of an atom are the electrons, or the negatively charged part. So all of these electrons are negative, and if you look in the nucleus, I have one, two, three protons. There might be a fourth one back here. Um, what an element, or what an electron is, is another negatively charged particle. It's much, much tinier than the protons and the neutrons. In fact, this is not drawn to scale. You wouldn't be able to see the dots for the electrons if I drew them to scale relative to how, how big the protons and the neutrons are. But what electrons do, um, first off, is they're found very far from the nucleus. So you have your nucleus in the middle, and then you have electrons way out elsewhere. Uh, they can get gained or lost in chemical reactions, which is very important to us. Um, watching electrons shift from one place to another is very important to uh, energy concerns, for example, later. And lastly, another thing that electrons do is help us to identify whether an atom is in an elemental state, a neutral state. So, for example, elemental carbon would have six protons and six electrons. They balance each other out. Six pluses and six minuses make zero. A carbon ion, say carbon minus two, would have six protons and eight electrons. It's unbalanced. It's got two more negatives. Or a carbon plus two would have six protons and four electrons, right? Four negatives and six positives leaves you with two plus. And so that becomes uh, important for us to be able to bookkeep that for later. How do we identify elements? If you take a look in the uh, cover of your book, in the back cover, you're going to find a periodic table. And in the periodic table, there are a number of boxes, and each box represents an element. And there are three uh, uh, things in that box that are going to be very important. The first one is the atomic number, Z. And the Z just tells you the number of protons. It's hydrogen because it has one proton. It's carbon because it has six protons. It's lithium because it has three protons. If we're talking about neutral atoms, and we don't have to worry about that for another few chapters, we would be telling you the number of electrons also. The big letter or letters in the middle of the box is the chemical symbol. That's a one or two letter abbreviation, and again, that's not always the same as the English name. right? H equals hydrogen. but Ag equals silver. I don't expect you to memorize or to learn chemical symbols, so I don't expect you to know that Ag means silver. On your exams, I will give you some way, either an annotated periodic table that you can take with you or reference to the front of your book, that will let you know what is what. But I do or expect you to be able to look at it and say, oh, this is an elemental symbol. The last important thing in those boxes on the periodic table is the bottom number, and this is what's called the atomic mass. Again, this is a concept you can put on ice for a couple of chapters, but what it's telling you is the average mass of a single atom of this stuff. So we're saying that one atom of H weighs 1.01 AMU, atomic mass units. It's a completely arbitrary unit. We made it up because atoms are very small, and we'd like to be able to count and say 1, 2, 3, 1.01 instead of a one with 16 zeros in front of it, which is how much it would be in kilograms. So these are the three numbers you're going to see in the box. For now, we're really mostly interested in the chemical symbol and the atomic number.